Hey church family, I'm Zach and I'm so happy you're joining us today. Attention men, the CCB men's ministry is starting a new Bible study in the book of Hebrews. In this study, we will meet for worship, teaching, and time in small groups, and we will learn of the supremacy of Jesus. This powerful study meets on Thursdays at 7 p.m. starting on January 4th in the sanctuary. Sign up at ccbeaumont.org under events. We are excited to announce that on Sunday, January 7th, we're going to be having a baptism following the third service. This is a great way to follow in the footsteps of Jesus and publicly proclaim your faith in him. Please sign up on the events page at ccbeaumont.org. And if you've already been baptized, come and support your brothers and sisters. Are you new to Jesus or have you been walking in him for many years? We're pleased to announce a class for everyone, CCB's Foundations in the Faith. This class is going to be starting on Sunday, January 14th at 8 a.m. and on Monday, January 15th at 6.30 p.m. in room number five. In this class, you're going to learn about the Holy Spirit, salvation, prayer, and many more topics on the Christian faith. So sign up today at ccbeaumont.org under events. Attention ladies, join the women of Calvary Chapel Beaumont as they continue their study experiencing God on January 9th at 9 a.m. or 6.30 p.m. In this study, you will be walking through the Bible to understand how to live a God-centered way of life that causes you to join God in His work. You will also meet for worship and teaching and time in small groups. In these groups, you will discuss what you learn about God, what you learn about yourself, and how you can apply the scriptures to your life. Child care is available in the morning session. Wives, do you want to reflect God's love and light in your marriage? Consider taking 10 weeks to focus on God's gift of marriage. The Bible study, Reflecting God's Love in Marriage, A Call to Wives, begins on January 15th at 6.30 p.m. Registration is limited, so sign up early at ccbeaumont.org under events. Church family, if you've experienced a major loss through the death of a loved one, Grief Share can assist you in the process of healing. Grief Share is a 14-week program where you can share your journey through grief with others who have experienced similar losses. During these biblically-based meetings, you will learn to understand your grief experience while exploring ways to grow emotionally and grow spiritually through the process. This group covers a variety of topics related to loss, including is this normal, the challenges of grief, the journey of grief, grief and your relationships. Grief Share begins on February 5th at 6 o'clock p.m. Sign up at ccbeaumont.org under events. Church family, we would love to pray for you. If you need prayer for anything, you can fill out a prayer request card in the sanctuary or you can email prayer at ccbeaumont.org. And even if you can't come to the sanctuary, you can also join the prayer team on Wednesday mornings at 8 a.m. in the sanctuary. You can also pray throughout the week for each request by using the Church Center app. See, through the app, you can sign up for the prayer group, receive the weekly prayer requests, and even send your own requests to the rest of the group. It's a great way to keep connected with your church family. We hope you love to worship the Lord. See, to worship the Lord with your tithes and offerings, you can drop them in the offering boxes on the sides of the media booth, or you can visit ccbowman.org and click the Give tab to give online. You can also mail them to the church office. So as we get ready to worship, please check your cell phone and make sure it's silent. This will help us cut down on any distractions. Remember to preach the gospel and love one another. Father, we come before you this morning thanking you, Lord, that uh, through this year of 2023, uh, there's been a lot of gospel preaching and a lot of loving each other at this church, Lord. And we thank you for putting that at the heart of this church, Father. We, we just give you thanks for that. Father, we just ask today that you would anoint Pastor Vince with the message, and Father, that he would um, uh, speak through you, uh, from you, through him to our hearts, Father, and that we would be changed. Father, we thank you. We thank you for this opportunity today. Well, in Jesus' name, amen. Why don't you all stand with us and wake up. Here we go. It's the song of the redeemed, rising from the ashes. 
Earth can claim It's the song of the forgiven Drowning out the Amazon rain The song of Asian believers Filled with God's holy fire It's every tribe, every tongue, every nation A love song born of a grateful choir It's all God's children singing glory, glory to greet some friends around you say hello and happy new year
the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise, there's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place, we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. Yes, Lord. We shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. We do Do you know that all the dark won't stop The light from getting through We do Do you wish that you could see it all made through We do creation groaning it is is a new creation coming it is is the glory of the Lord to be a light within our midst it is is it good that we remind ourselves of the 
scroll The Lion of Judah Who conquered the grave He is David's root And the Lamb who died To ransom the slave And every people and tribe Every nation and tongue He has made us a kingdom of priests to God To reign with His Son Is He worthy? Is He worthy? Of all blessing and honor and glory Is He worthy? Is He worthy? Is He worthy? I'll still bless you. I bless your name. I 
We're so grateful for your faithfulness, for your love, for your justice, for your mercy. We're so grateful for the blessing of Jesus Christ in our lives. I thank you, Father, for the gathering here today, for those in-house and those online. I pray that your Holy Spirit would fill us, Lord, and bless us and open up our ears and our hearts and our minds to what you would have to say to us today. I thank you, Lord, that you're good and you're holy and you deserve all of our praise because of your faithfulness thank you for the privilege of praying to you and for you to receive what we say and so thank you Lord I ask a blessing on my family and friends here today that you would be with us and encourage us continue to remind us of your goodness that we might serve you faithfully Thank you, Lord, for all that you've done and are doing. Be with those who are sick. Be with those who are lonely. Be with those who may be depressed even now. We ask you to do a work in all of our hearts that as this year comes to an end, next year would be a greater amount of love for you, a greater amount of service to the church body and to you, that we would be filled with joy and peace and love and you'd be honored in everything we do and say in 2024. Thank you, Father, for today. We want to give you all of our attention and our time. Lord, may I rightly divide your word this morning. May you speak through me. May we all be learning and growing in Jesus. And it's, as in, it's in his name we pray. Amen and amen. Good morning. Have a seat. <clears throat> Welcome to the last day of the year. <laughs> Welcome to church. Thanks for showing up. How many of you staying up past midnight? <laughs> Two of you. Good job. <laughs> yes. Good job. Um, Pastor Vince, one of the pastors here at Calvary Chapel, and thanks for coming. I recognize a lot of you, but not everybody. Um, after service, there's a table outside. We'd love for you to fill out a card. So Pastor Henry... Loves writing letters to you guys. I would, but he loves doing it so much I let him. <laughs> but he'll write you a letter. He'll, he'll just introduce himself. And uh, God has just been so good to, to us and to this church. And look at you guys all smiley up early. Because you're going to bed early, right? <laughs> a few announcements. Um, there's going to be a prayer meeting tonight at 5 o'clock. From 5 to 6. Come on out. And then you can go to bed at 6.30, okay? And there's no agenda other than we're going to lift up things going on in the next year and whatever God may do in us and through us. So 5 o'clock in here, come on out. Don't be shy. It'll be a good, blessed time together as a church family. A few announcements. This Thursday at 7, the men's ministry is starting up their study in Hebrews. It's called The Supremacy of Jesus. So sign up online under the events tab, and that'll be for any event. You can go there and see them. Um, there'll be a foundations class starting up in a couple of weeks on Sunday mornings and Monday nights. Sign up again at uh, ccbeaumont.org under events. Uh, there's a lady study starting up on the 8th, I believe it is, of January. I'm looking for some confirmation. Yes, 9th. The women's Bible study starts Tuesday the 9th, you're correct. On the 8th is a women's study, and it's called, and I wish I remember the title, but there's a slide they're going to show in a second, and there it is, Reflecting God's Love in Marriage. I've seen that title for like 
10 years and I can't remember. But that's for ladies only. And if you want to increase the love you have in your, in your marriage and for the Lord, I suggest you sign up and attend. Karen Roberts will be leading that Monday nights at 6.30. And it's coming up quick. And there's a bunch of other stuff going on. Oh, baptisms next week. Praise the Lord, it's not today. <laughs> I think Pastor Henry may be thinking that right now. But next week, hopefully it's sunnier, warmer, and things go better next week. And we're going to baptize a bunch of folks, hopefully. And if you've not been baptized, sign up online. And if you have, come on out and just support this declaration of what God's done on the inside that people are declaring about Jesus and what he's doing in their lives. So come on out next week after third service. All right, so we have a topical study today. So today's study is called Your Future in Christ. Your Future in Christ. And we're going to go to Matthew 24. Matthew 24. Uh, next week, Pastor Henry will be starting up in uh, Timoth or Thessalonians. Uh, but today we're going to be in Matthew 24. There's some Bibles in front of you if you don't have one. And uh, I'm going to start out with a very controversial statement. Very. You ready? I was born in late 1967. You're thinking, oh, he's just a puppy. He's not even 60 yet. <laughs> Some of you are thinking, I thought he was 35. No, my son's almost 30. Some of you thinking he's 80. Well, I'm closer to 80 than 30. Yet I miss my, fit, my 40s. For others, this guy's ready for the old folks' home. For some, it's like, who are you? But this is my story. Growing up in the 70s and 80s, we were young and wild and free, according to Brian Adams, that poet. <laughs> Growing up in the day as a kid, the future looked bright. I could play all day with my brothers, ride our bikes for miles away from home, return when the streetlight comes on, of course, have family meals almost every night, dream of a future, Success in just about every major league sport because I was going to do all of them. <laughs> I was going to be young forever. As the years progressed, I look forward to driving someday, falling in love, getting married, having kids, and repeating the good times and the good life I grew up with. I was privileged in having a loving set of parents. Our family had a station wagon. Remember those? A white picket fence really, a dog, loving parents, went to a church every Sunday, maybe not the right kind of church, they meant well, and we lived in the great old U.S. of A. So of course we're going to heaven, right? <laughs> Russia was the enemy, the president was revered, remember those days? The Dodgers are going to win every World Series, at least next year they will. And the American dream was our hope. What could be better? The future was certain. Anyone live that life? But God. But in 1997, God showed up and became, came on my radar. At a co-worker's dining room table, the presentation of the gospel changed my future and became a new reality for me. And because of that day, I stand before you now. Never in my wildest imagination did I imagine being here doing this at this moment in time. But God. But God had a plan. And God has a plan for everybody here, even these little guys. Even those with a little gray hair or maybe not so much hair. Those who don't hear so well. He's got a plan. Now maybe you grew up under cir similar circumstances, but maybe, maybe your past is radically different. Maybe you grew up in the inner city, poor, no dad in the family, no mom in the family, raised by grandma, I don't know. We've all got different histories. But somehow, for some reason, God has brought all of us here today, right now at this moment, in this place, to worship the Lord and hear about Him. Amen. Isn't that unique? If we all had the same past, you'd all be just as boring as me. Come on. <laughs> this is one thing is certain, though. You can revolutionize, excuse me, I'll try English. You can revolutionize your future today by receiving Jesus Christ as your Savior. 
Know that much. You can revolutionize your eternity forever today by receiving Jesus Christ because I don't assume that everybody knows him. Here or online. Hi, online. At the end of service, I'll say it now because I'll forget later, there'll be folks up here to pray for you, whether you receive Jesus or not or you just want to be encouraged in Christ. That opportunity's coming later in the message for you to receive Jesus. Now, if you're a believer, uh, turn your ears back on, okay? God has something to say to you too that may revolutionize your walk in Christ and your attitude towards one another. Let's turn to Matthew 24. You guys are already there. Give me an amen. amen. In chapter 23, there's this scene at, uh, at the temple that plays out right before 24. And Jesus gives a bunch of woes to the scribes and Pharisees. Jesus' woes are a declaration against the religious leaders for their hypocrisy. Those religious leaders had an ungodly heart attitude and manner of leading the Jewish nation. Jesus proclaims how the scribes and Pharisees have shut up the kingdom of heaven, devoured widows' houses, made false followers of God, that they put their trust in the temple and its gold. These religious leaders might tithe of mint and cumin, but fail to show justice, mercy, and faith. Jesus rebukes them as a brood of vipers, exclaiming they may be clean on the outside, but they're dirty on the inside. In verse 37 of chapter 23, he says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who were sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate, for I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. In a short time, Jesus will fulfill this prophecy, entering Jerusalem, riding a donkey on Palm Sunday, and the people will proclaim, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. I saw that gate in Israel this year that he entered through. The Muslims made the Jews uh, fill it up so they can't enter through it anymore because they didn't want the Messiah coming through, but it's too late. <laughs> Ultimately, this will lead to his arrest and crucifixion. Jesus knew their hearts, the hearts of the Pharisees. Point number one, Jesus knows your heart. He knows your heart. When I say your, mine as well. I'm not excluded. Jesus' desire is that Israel as a nation would come and receive him, but they were blind to who he was and why he was there. His heart is sorrowful over their rejection of him, and he knows their future. Jesus desires that you and I would come and receive him if we've not. That we'd no longer be blind to who he is and why he came to earth. His heart is sorrowful over anyone's rejection of him and he knows all of our futures. If you haven't prioritized Jesus in your life today, today is the day to make things right. Today's that day. We're supposed to finish well. Let's finish 2023 well and get things right with Jesus today. Did you know the majority of the world rejects Jesus? The majority of the world rejects Jesus. Have you been rejecting him? Have you pushed him aside? Is he not really a priority anymore? Why? Why? What's preventing you today from receiving him or simply getting things right? Pastor Henry taught on the prodigal son two weeks ago, I think. The father was willing to receive him just like he's willing to receive anybody today that would want him. Amen. Let's read verse 1, chapter 24. Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, Do you see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left up upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, 
Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled. For all these things must come to pass for the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines, pestilences and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation to kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for not my name's sake. And then many will be offended and will betray one another and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many, and because lawless, lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. Ooh, heavy, heavy stuff. First of all, Jesus is predicting the, the destruction of the temple. Back in verse 1, Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple. His disciples came to show him the buildings of the temple. Jesus said to them, Do you see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left upon another that will not be thrown down. Point one was Jesus knows your heart. Point two, Jesus knows your future. He knew the future of the temple. We're going to have a few slides up here about the temple. So there's the Wailing Wall, the Western Wall in Israel. We got to visit that this year. The next slide, please. It's made of blocks, right? So is the temple. The temple is a little nicer looking, though. Next slide. There's the Wailing Wall. Again, that's a ramp on the right side that you can go up to this portion. Um, there's the Dome of the Rock on the left. That's a Muslim dome. It's not Christian. It's not Jewish. But behind those trees, somewhere in there is going to be the temple. Next slide, please. And this is a representation of the temple. And it's, it's very, very large. It's 60 by 20 by 30 cubits. So 90 by 30 by 45. You do the math. I don't know. Feet. But then there's this massive buildings and pillars and all this stuff that's going on here. And this is what they're talking about. Not one stone will be left upon another, according to Jesus. For the Jews, the temple is many things. It's a massive structure, a holy site, the place they'd have animal sacrifice so that their sin would be forgiven or covered by blood once a year, which foreshadowed what Jesus did on the cross. It's an important place, and it, it was revered. It is revered by them. There's the Temple Institute right now, because it's been destroyed, and they've already made all the parts. They're already raising up cattle. They're already doing all these things to get ready for the next temple because they re revere it so much. But Jesus here makes this astounding statement that one day the most important Jewish site will be destroyed. And this is unthinkable to the Jews. What? To the religious leaders, the temple was what they swore by and what they based their lives upon. They had no longer trusted in God, but rather the temple and its gold. Mm. Is there something that you and I might be trusting in more than God? No. Is it our temple, our house, our gold, our bank account, retirement fund? Is it our job? Do we trust more in our mode of transportation or our kids or our grandkids? Now, all these things should be enjoyed, but not enjoyed more than the Lord in our lives. Amen. After all, he gave us these things and those relationships as a gift to enjoy, not to take the place of him. Amen. Imagine the religious leaders back in the day, their whole world being shattered in AD 70 when the Romans surround the city, starve out the people, invade, push down block by block the temple and destroy it. That would demoralize them. But they also did it out of greed um, because when they did that, they did it to retrieve the gold that was in the building. There's a couple different stories about the temple's destruction. One is an arrow went through with fire and caught on fire. Somehow it caught on fire. The gold in the walls melted into the cracks of the building, of the blocks. And so the Roman soldiers pushed it down to get this gold back. The very thing the religious leaders valued is what destroyed the object of their affections, the temple. God allows this to happen because of the rejection of him. 
because of the rebellion of Israel, because of the rejection of his son. Imagine if every Christian church building was taken away, what would happen to our faith? Our faith is not in a building. Now we're looking to build two more, praise the Lord. But that's to gather more folks around to minister to more hearts and have more friends. That's what it's for. They're just buildings. Uh, the earth is God's footstool. So what's a building? Who can build them a sanctuary? Have any of us been too dependent on a thing or a person more than the master builder? Now, I'm not saying don't come to church, don't feel at home here, none of that stuff. Just make sure to prioritize your walk in Christ over any other thing. Now, part of our walk in Christ is to be obedient to him, right? No? Yes. That's a whole nother sermon. Come on. <laughs> Should we obe be obedient to Jesus? Yes. Yeah. Amen. One more time. Should we be obedient to Jesus? Okay, good. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I do counseling. <laughs> in being obedient to him, we're to love one another, correct? Yes. Good. Getting better. Did we use decaf this morning? <laughs> Loving one another includes ministering to others, correct? Yes. Oh. We're not to be some sort of Christian hermit, correct? Correct. Can't just go love Jesus on your own in Alaska and avoid people. Sounds good, <laughs> but it's hard to get someone saved if you don't see him face to face. We're to minister to one another, family. Whether it's your first day or you've been here 25 years, whatever, we're to minister to one another. Jesus not only knows the future of the temple, he knows your future for the believer in Christ. This is your future. This is from John 14. It says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Thank you for that clap. <laughs> Jesus is preparing a place right now for every believer in Christ. And he's going to return for that believer one day, factual. Why would you build something if you're not going there? It's not theoretical. It's going to happen. And then Thomas says to him, Lord, we, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, Lord, I'm sorry, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus, Jesus alone gets us there. That's it, trusting in him. This wonderful future is promised for every believer in Christ. Jesus will return and take you and I to the place he's preparing now. This life is very temporary. What a beautiful thought. He's going to bring you home. It's a wonderful promise to all believers. And this year, many of our friends grasped hold of that exact promise we did so many memorials this year. Beloved people, unexpected, and now they're with Jesus. Praise the Lord. This wonderful future is not promised for non-believers. Jesus is not returning for the non-believer to take them to his father's house. When the non-believer perishes, they go to the great white throne judgment. It's in Revelation 20, if you want to turn there. Revelation 20, verse 11. And these verses make me sad. The thought of people standing before God. Never to see him again. Revelation 20, 11. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was no place, found no place for them. This is John getting a vision of what it's going to look like. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. 
The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Our works are like filthy rags, family. I would say greasy oil rag, but it's worse than that. That's what our works are like. But filled with the Holy Spirit, praising the Lord, serving Him, the believer gets rewarded for his works. 14, then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And here's this sad verse. Anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. It's all non-believers. People we know. People we know. If we're to love others and minister to them, let's tell them about Jesus. That they might avoid this, number one, but most importantly, that they would know him. That they would know him. Amen? Amen. Moving forward. The first death was physical. We all have that unless we're raptured. The second death is a spiritual death. So Jesus knows our future, so what is your future? Is he returning for you? Or are you going to be standing at the great white throne judgment? I want to see y'all there in heaven. Verse 3 in Matthew 24. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? So they want to know the signs of the times and the end of the age, and we're still asking those questions today, are we not? It's in the news we see stuff playing out. The disciples want to know. They're filled with questions they have for Jesus, and this is a good thing. It's good. They wanted to know Jesus' thoughts. They want him to inform them of what's going to happen. Wanting to know the mind of Christ should be on the forefront of our minds, Amen. right? We should wonder about what he thinks, ponder what he says, and ask questions to find out answers. If our mind is curious like this, we will seek after the things of God and discover things we never knew about him. It's hard to find something if you're not looking for it. Now, if you're not curious about this, about the things of God, about finding more about the Lord and His ways, be careful. A mind that doesn't inquire about the things of God will become lax, disinterested, apathetic, even uncaring about the things of the Lord. And you see people fall away. Psalm 27, 4, one of my favorite verses in the Bible, I have many, but here's one. One thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. It's not just seeing God in his beauty, but it's inquiring in his temple to learn more about him. He is everything. And we know poquito. We know enough to know how good he is, but we really don't know how good he is. In heaven, I believe, we'll discover more and more about that. We'll be flooded by feelings and thoughts and just textures and whatever's going on there. We just get a glimpse of it in Revelation. And we're going to enjoy that together. Point one, Jesus knows your heart. Point two, Jesus knows your future. Point three, keep inquiring about Jesus. Keep inquiring about Jesus. In the Bible, there's several places that says, he who has an ear, let him hear. Uh, We have three dogs at home. One's a -a year-and-a-half-year-old puppy. He's all energy and no brains. (laughs) If food comes out, that's all he thinks about. And sometimes I take him by the ears, gently, PETA, don't come after me. I don't hurt him. I say, sometimes you're so good, and sometimes you never listen. So I'm going to rip your ears off. I'd never heard him, so don't worry. But that's how it could be in church. We all have ears, right? At least most of us. Are we hearing? Are we using them? Or does it just go in one and out the other? If you're coming to church or reading the Word and you're not moved by either of them, be careful. The Word of God should move us. It's written to inspire us, to train us, to grow us. 
On Saturday night, our hearts should be pounding, ready to come to church to hear what the Holy Spirit might speak to us. Or Tuesday, or whenever. We should look forward to our normal times of refreshing. God is going to speak. We should have an expectation and anticipation of learning something new about the Lord and about ourselves. One of my, another favorite scripture, sorry. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. He spoke it. It's profitable for doctrine. It benefits us for what we should know, believe. For reproof, there's the conviction of the Holy Spirit. For correction, that we can change our direction. And for instruction in righteousness, that we might be taught how to live righteously. That the man of God or woman may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. God created us to serve him for good works. In order to do that, we need the scripture to train us up. God uses his scripture to change us. Isaiah 55 says this, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my, <clears throat> excuse me. So are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. The Father knows everything, every concept, every truth. He is truth. He is love. And he allows us to learn some of that stuff. If we read what he says, we can learn more and more about him and one another and ourselves. So the disciples here want to know what Jesus thinks. So they ask him. Verse number 4, Matthew 24. And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. This is a warning from Jesus to take heed, to pay attention, to be careful. Deception is nothing new, right? Eve was deceived in the garden. Um, Jim Jones deceived the people's temple, leading to 909 deaths. David Koresh deceived the Branch Davidians, professing himself to be a spiritual descendant of King David, a messianic figure carrying out a divinely commissioned errand, which led to 79 people dying. Now, I know those are extreme examples, but there's other forms that are more subtle. Are there not? When someone knocks on your door and they smile and they're friendly and they're genuine, they believe what they're telling you, but it's another gospel. They may not believe that Jesus is God. There's a problem. They may believe that one day they're going to get their own planet. <laughs> I can't handle this one. <laughs> they may think they have a special truth that no one else has but them. Be careful. It's another gospel. You can turn to 2 Corinthians 11 if you'd like. 2 Corinthians 11. Talking about deception. It's to the right of Matthew. Second Corinthians eleven, verse one. And this is uh, Paul and his fear for the church in Corinth. And he said, Oh, that you would bear with me a little folly. And indeed you do bear with me. For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. So talking about the church being the bride of Christ. But I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity of, that is in Christ. Corrupted from the simplicity, that is in Christ. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus whom, you have not, whom we have not preached, or if you have received a different spirit from which we have not received, or a different gospel which you have not, have not accepted, you may well put up with it. He was worried someone come knocking at their door, smiling and friendly, tell them something, and they'd be like, oh, that sounds great. That's his fear for the church in Corinth. They left behind the simplicity that is Christ. He was afraid they would do that. And what is that simplicity? Jesus came to earth. He died. 
He paid for our sins. He rose again. He ascended into heaven. When we receive him, we're saved. It's that simple. Point one, Jesus knows your heart. Point two, Jesus knows your future. Point three, keep inquiring about Jesus. And point four, the word corrects, corrects, corrects deception. The word corrects deception. The simplicity of Christ is such a simple and beautiful phrase. So how do we know if it's another gospel? How do we know? By knowing the real gospel. By knowing the spoken word. The truth spoken in the word. If you want to take what they say at your door and and any pamphlet you see and anything someone says to you about Jesus, including myself or Pastor Henry or Pastor Jim, you want to take that and filter it through the word. See if what we say is what God says. And if it ain't, come tell us. Now, we don't speak perfectly. No one can tame the tongue. Okay, especially me. But see the intent behind what we do say. When you want to take what, we, what they say at the door at face value, it's very deceiving. It can be. So ask yourself this. Is what they're telling me what God is saying? Is what someone is telling me is what God is actually saying? <laughs> Acts 17 says this, And the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas Away by night to Berea, when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Therefore, many of them believed, and also not a few of the Greeks, prominent women as well as men. The Bereans searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. If we're in it once a month, it's not going to help us a whole lot. But as we're in it daily, Lord willing, we will learn and grow. And when deception comes our way, hang on, I don't see that here, show me. This is what God actually says. So when was the last time, church family, you heard something about the scripture and in response you searched the scripture to see if these things were so? When was the last time you did that? Hopefully daily. Or did you assume it was just correct? Let's go to verse 6 in Matthew 24. So we're talking about deception. Verse 6. And you'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled. For these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, earthquakes in various places. All of these are the beginning of sorrows. So talking about the the last days. For the Jews, the temple was destroyed in AD 70. For the last days, you see any of this that we just read taking place now? Any of it? All of it? Some of it? You'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Are we called to be paralyzed in fear over what is taking place today? No, it says, see that you're not troubled. You're going to hear of it, but see that you're not troubled. Why? For these things must come to pass. It's part of God's plan for all of mankind. They're going to happen. It's happening. Are we near the end now? Are we actually in the last days? It says, but the end is not yet. You can hear these things, don't be troubled. The end is not yet. This I do know, because I have pastor friends. They say we are. We're on the verge. We're deep into it. This is what I know. We're closer today than we've ever been before. Amen. Whether we are or not, what are we called to do? Not be troubled by it. To abide in Christ. Because if we aren't, we should be abiding in Christ. If we are, we definitely should be abiding in Christ. Close to him, no matter the circumstance. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilence, earthquakes, various places. All these things are the beginning of sorrows. Are we in the beginning of sorrows? Bigger question, do we have any control to stop any of this from happening? No. No. Mm. 
Verse 9, then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, will hate one another, and many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. So what part of all that can we control? Can we stop wars? Can we prevent nations from rising against one another? Can we stop famines, pestilence, earthquakes? I want to see you stop an earthquake. (laughs) Can we prevent false prophets from coming on the scene and spouting out non-biblical nonsense? It's been happening from way back. But what can we control in all these things? We can control that we are not troubled. We can control that to keep our love from growing cold. Don't be troubled. Don't let your love grow cold. You can control that. How? You may think, oh, you don't know all the sorrow, pain, and heartache I've experienced in my life and all the disappointment. <coughs> You're right. I don't. True. But what does God say in Philippians 4? Turn to Philippians 4. Verse 4. Some more of my favorite verses. Sorry. I'm biased against these ones. How do we control that we're not troubled? How do we keep our love going and not going cold? Philippians 4, 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. When do we rejoice? We celebrate Him. Let your gentleness be be made known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Have a gentle spirit about you. If you're really rough, use some sandpaper, sand off those edges. Use the word. Be anxious for everything? Oh, yours says nothing? Okay, we'll go with nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Give me your prayers. Lord, this troubles me, I give it to you. Lord, this irritates me, I give it to you. And here's the promise. And the peace of God, the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. It's so simple. So if I, get, if I rejoice in God, if I'm a gentle spirit, if I give him my prayers, he's going to guard my heart and mind. Simple. It's part of the simplicity of Christ. And then it goes on to say, verse 8, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, noble, just, pure, lovely, good report, virtuous, praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Does it say to meditate on wars and rumors of wars? <coughs> Pestilences, earthquakes, famines? No, meditate on true, noble, pure, lovely, good report, virtuous. That's what we meditate on, family. Living a lifestyle of Philippians 4, 4 through 8, controls this and this, and we can see situations with godly eyes and hearts and minds, and we respond to situations in a godly manner, and then we're not upset. If you're upset all the time, we all get upset. When the Rams lose, I get upset. <laughs> That's my biggest difficulty in life. Anyways, <laughs> never mind. Moving on. If we're always upset, that tells me that I haven't been in the Word enough to guard this and this. If I'm always riled up. That's why. When I'm here, it, oh, here comes the conviction. Here comes the, the chastisement. Here comes the refreshing. Here comes the reminder. He's going to come back for me someday. And then you got peace. In Isaiah 26, 3, it says, You will keep him in perfect peace, perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. You keep your mind on Christ. You keep doing the Philippians 4 lifestyle. Then you just have this peaceful, calm attitude throughout life. And when people are riled up, you can go, Hey, brother, sister, let's look at some of these verses together. Another one of my favorites, here it comes. 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy 1, 7, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Love that one. Verse 13 in Matthew 24. It says, But he who endures to the end shall be saved, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. 
So the gospel has to get around before the end actually comes. It's gotten around, but then there's new people, so there's new people to hear it. So what's the timeline? I don't know. God does. Point one, Jesus knows your heart. Two, Jesus knows your future. Three, keep inquiring about Jesus. Four, the word corrects deception. And five, be a part of God's plan for mankind. Be a part. We have to be careful that just because we know we're going to heaven, that it gives us license to take our foot off the gas and not do anything. Be careful with this attitude. It could be very easy to be complacent. Easy to think we deserve salvation because after all, look how good we are. Uh huh. You may pray every day, read every day, pay your tithe, come to church events, but you can still develop that hard attitude of the scribes and Pharisees thinking, I'm doing all the right stuff, so I know I'm good. Be careful not to think of the church as a country club, as an additional source of comfort to a comfortable life. When was the goal in life to have a comfortable life? If your life is completely comfortable, how much are you striving for the sake of the gospel? Be careful not to think you deserve to be saved because after all, look at you. <laughs> look at this. Oh my goodness. In the world, there are all kinds of folks, trans kids, trans adults, drug addicts, homeless, convicts, homosexuals, gossips, thieves, prideful, who need Jesus too. God desires that all would come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Not just the good people, because none are good. The derelicts, the unworthy, the misfits, even tax collectors, prostitutes, and sinners. God would want all of them to know Jesus, to repent and be saved. And they're out there, and they're in here. Because we all fit those categories. The Lord wants us all to surrender to him. So be careful not to think you're good to go because you're so good, but fail the way to your matters of justice, mercy, and faith. Moving forward, let's turn to Acts 8. We'll be ending up fairly quickly here. Acts chapter 8, verse 26. Love this story. I'm talking about being used in God's kingdom. Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise, go to toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. We've heard about Gaza, haven't we? Hmm. This is desert. So he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning. And sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the Spirit said to Philip, Go near and overtake the chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, Do you understand what you're reading? And he said, How can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. The place in the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before its shearer is silent. So he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. Who are we talking about there? This is Old Testament prophesying about what happens to Jesus. So the eunuch is there like, what's it say? 34. So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask of you, whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or of some other man? Here's the big part. Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this, this scripture, preached Jesus to him. Preached Jesus to him. Now as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? And Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still. 
And both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. Now when they had come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away. So the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found as, as, as Otis, maybe. And passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. So here is Philip being used by God in an unusual circumstance. Those things ever happen to you? It's an unscheduled event in man's economy, but God has scheduled this meeting with the eunuch from Ethiopia to meet Philip to come to salvation in Jesus. God knew. Philip didn't. But Philip was ready and available to be used by God in this unusual manner. What if Philip wasn't willing? What if he, fe he felt it was inconvenient to get up and go? What if he didn't feel like running? Everybody needs to start running. <laughs> what if he wasn't bold to ask the question, do you understand what you're reading? What if he didn't preach Jesus to this man? What would have happened to this eunuch? Well, God has other ways of bringing Christ to people, of course. But Philip was ready, willing, and able to do as the angel of the Lord spoke to him. Ready, willing, and able. I wonder just how many unusual encounters God has in place for the church family in 2024. Even the end of 2023. I wonder just how many people will come to salvation because of the people of CCB were ready to share Christ with others. Are you ready, willing, and able to do as God directs next year? Are you? Are you ready? I look forward to hearing the unusual stories. This brother, this sister came to Christ. I got a flat tire. He changed it. I told him about Jesus, and now he's saved. <laughs> or whatever it's going to be. Look forward to that. And then these empty seats that we have, all of a sudden, there's the flat tire guy. There's the guy you met at Walmart. There's the one that was at work, whatever it might be. I can't wait to hear those stories. So as 2023 comes to a close, let's remove anything ungodly, any ungodly attitudes. I know half of you got new gym memberships, right? <laughs> well, I ain't going to work. Why don't we just dive into the Word more? Amen. Let's seek His face faithfully, keep growing individually, and as a church body. Everyone look around right now. Make eye contact with somebody you don't know. Do it. Do it. <laughs> what you're seeing is a bunch of flawed individuals who come to church on Sunday to praise the Lord, me included. Amen? This is your church family. So I can't wait to see what God does through each and every one of you this coming year. So a few takeaway points. The first one is this, as the worship team comes up. Trust the one who knows your heart. Trust the one who knows your heart. Takeaway two is turn back to Jesus immediately. Turn back to Jesus immediately. And then point three is look forward to his plan for you. God has a plan for you. Grasp it and follow it. Amen? Yeah. And amen. So at the beginning of this message, I promise that you're going to have the opportunity to come to Jesus or to get right with him. And we're going to pray, and now is that opportunity, and we're going to have some folks in the corners who are going to pray for you, with you. It's going to be a beautiful time. So let's pray together right now. So Father in heaven, I confess to you that I am a great sinner but Jesus, I admit that you're an even greater Savior. I confess right now that you, Jesus, are Lord, that you died on the cross, that you rose again for me. I thank you that you have saved me from my sins. I call upon you right now to save me, to cleanse me, to wash me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. I thank you for the work that you're doing in me. Thank you for saving me on this day. And Father, if there anyone be here that uh, is far from you, Lord, may they pray this, Lord, receive me back to you. 
draw me close. Remind me of all the good promises you've given me. Cleanse my heart and mind that I might follow you closely, Lord. I may be struggling, but I know you're there. So help me in my struggles and in my weakness that I might seek after you this year and this coming year. And I thank you that you received me. So, Father, we praise you this morning. We give you thanks and praise for everything you've done in our lives. We look forward to whatever it is you're going to do next year. We bless your holy name and we praise you because you're worthy to be praised. And all of God's people said, Amen and Amen. Let's worship the Lord.
spirit strong in me my flesh may fail my god you never will i may be weak but your spirit strong in me my flesh may fail my god you never will i may be weak your spirit strong in me my flesh may fail but my God, you never will. Amen. Amen. If you did business with Jesus today, if you said yes to him, come down front and pray with these nice folks down here. God bless you all. Happy New Year.